What is he trying to is he trying to catch one? I don't know if I can do this. This this is going to be a big job. You don't. Hey, Ed, the commodity prices are flying. You think the chickens are coming home to roost or what? <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me, James, like the chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs> Welcome to another Modest Litter. Raw! I'm here with Maybe Mike. you should change that to Rawhide. Rawhide! <laughs> this is actually Midas Litter Red Cup Friday. Cheers, Edward. What's in the red cup? Well, we can't say. But it's good. Mm -hmm. Anyways, we have a hell of a show for you today. We're here on the cusp of the eve of the destruction of the financial system in its entirety, the hyperinflationary madness that is being demonstrated in the commodity space has now manifested itself in the consumer price index. Now, if you don't know what the consumer price index, it's basically a basket, basket, Bill, I can't even speak, must yeah. have something to do yeah, with yeah, red cup. Excuse the fly, okay. <laughs> We do this when there's a fly in the studio now, do we? To, <laughs> Anyways, the consumer to price index to is a basket of goods, goods. representative prices, and Commodity, it rose. Yeah, right. Last month in April, it rose by 0.8%. Well, it, there's, a, there's a lot of different uh, measuring sticks, and they it was a big number. Big. Big surprise. Big, 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 big. Big, big surprise, big, big. and that's why now we know rates went from 0.67% to 1.67. You know, you know so what I'm is saying? it safe to say on an annualized basis that inflation as measured by the CPI is currently running above 10%? That's about 10, yeah, I would say that's a, yeah. So it, is it, it safe to say that the Fed might have overshot its target of 2% inflation? Well, that's the big dilemma, right? That's what the, that Wall Street's saying, they're being too accommodative now. Right. Wall they Street's should saying. be, yeah, they're saying, hey, well, you guys are letting this out. Of, this is going to start to. And what do we say in Haldeman County? The chickens are coming home to roost. The chickens are coming home to roost. People, you heard it here first. And a long and, time and, ago, and you, you, you know what? And also, we've heard, we're hearing about gasoline shortages in the Northeast of well, the United States. Well, that was States. because of that. Those no, evil, but, dirty but, hackers. They, they say there's a dearth. A dearth. A dearth, which sounds like an excess, but is actually the opposite. It's the opposite. And, and there's a dearth one. of uh, uh, transport drivers in the U.S. Because they all got COVID. No, no, because they just don't have the people to do it. Because they all got stimmy checks and they're no, at the beach. I, you, you know what? There's, <laughs> there's a myriad of reasons. Sure. The, the point is, the fact is, there's a dearth of drivers. So, on that note, on that topic, yes. on that very subject, yes. there is a dearth of, it seems, everything. If we look at some of the commodity prices, we're gonna talk about commodities as usual because right. we can't overstate the significance of what is unfolding now in financial markets. And it has been core to our theme since we started We've doing the show We've been talking about ago. this. We, yeah. we, 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 you know, as soon as that interest rate started moving, yeah. pay attention, yes. pay attention. But uh, so today on the show, we've got a bunch of uh, really great guests. And these guests are sort of indicative of what you might want to be consuming when the whole mirror hits the proverbial blades of the fan. Uh, you might want to be talking to, uh, well, you might want to hear from Dan Ahrens, who's the author of the book, Investing in Cannabis. Uh -huh. He's also the chief operating officer of uh, Advisor Shares Investments, who is the portfolio manager of the Pure Cannabis 
Okay. ETF trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol MSOS. Dan and I have this great conversation because Dan literally wrote the book on investing in cannabis. Yeah. So he gives us a great perspective on all and the he's cannabis. he's based in New York? He's based in New York City. Uh, after that, Doug Drysdale joins us. He's the CEO of Cybin Inc., which is a cannabis, or not a cannabis company, uh, but a uh, magic mushroom company, psychedelics company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. psilocybin. 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 And then ESC Entertainment CEO, Conrad Wasiella, actually it's pronounced Vachella, I now recall. Uh, he joins us, and he's going to tell us about ESC Entertainment, which is involved in the... Uh, in the uh, esports industry, G gaming, in esports, gaming, and media. So Conrad Walesha was a Canadian football player of a professional level. So we have okay. all that okay. more. Okay. Um, let's see. What the hell? This thing's not supposed to be down there. But also, so we're going to talk about why the chickens are coming home to roost and what the CPI means. To the, in the bigger picture, in the grand scheme of things, you know, as it were. Can I just say something? Nope, not yet. And we're going to talk about commodities and hyperinflation. Copper, lumber, oil, steel, gold, the U.S. 10-year rate. We're going to talk about True Leaves' purchase of Harvest Health, which was announced this week. They're now the biggest. And now the biggest. And uh, then we're going to talk, of course, about... Tillery uh, had disappointing results. You know that, eh? Tillery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we're not going to beat up on poor old Tillery okay. today. We're going to let okay. Dan do that. Okay. But... Um, he makes some great points, which I don't want to blow the interview by talking about it ahead of it. But uh, also, we're going to talk about our sponsor of the show is Voxter Analytics, trading VXTR on the TSX Venture and trading in the United States under the new symbol VXTRF. Voxter Analytics is real estate at the speed of light. I am a shareholder, and they are a client of a re related company. And so we should be considered conflicted whenever we mention uh, Boxster Analytics. I also am a shareholder in a company called Graphene Manufacturing Corp. We're going to look at that chart a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, that thing seems to be in a bit of a rocket ship. Bit of a tear. Uh, bit of a tear. Yeah, a rocket ship. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, once you're on the hey. back, once you're on the Midas letter platform, things seem to tend to go on one there direction you go. only. There you go. Uh, but yeah, so. Um, Can I get on that show? You're on the show. Okay. You're the star of the show. Oh, okay. You actually are the only reason people watch this thing. It certainly isn't to hear me go willy nilly <laughs> pell mell all over the place. All right, all right. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, first we're going to hear soft. from Soft. Soft. on you. Hello. Here's Dan Aarons, Chief Operating Officer of Advisor Shares Investments. Hey there, Midas Letter subscribers, viewers, traders, and investors. I have a special guest today. Dan Aarons is the Chief Operating Officer of Advisor Shares Investments, who are the portfolio managers of the Pure U.S. Cannabis ETF. Trades on the NYSE under the symbol MSOS. Dan, welcome. Glad to be here. I always like talking about cannabis funds. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, not only are you the manager of the cannabis fund, but you actually wrote the book on investing in cannabis. And to me, that's just fascinating. I have, I've had delusions of doing something similar, but of course, uh, procrastination is my guiding principle in life. So I didn't do it yet, but tell me about the book and did you write the book out of your experience as a portfolio manager, or did you become the portfolio manager because you wrote the book? <laughs> well, the portfolio manager came first. Um, okay. You know, we launched our first cannabis ETF in the United States in uh, April of 19. That's the uh, Advisor Shares Pure Cannabis ETF. That ticker symbol is YOLO. And then uh, much more recently, in September of 20, we opened the Pure US Cannabis obviously only U.S. focused, ticker symbol MSOS or MSOs. That one launched in September of 2020. But early in 2020 or maybe after launching YOLO, I'm not sure when, you know, Wiley sought me out. They saw this big movement happening in cannabis investing. They sought me out, asked me if I wanted to write a book and, um, after uh, going back and forth a little bit with my busy schedule, I said, sure. I thought it was win-win. That book was actually released on election day in November and election day in the United States was pretty big for cannabis. So um, yeah, the book's available everywhere. It's Investing in Cannabis, uh, published by Wiley. It's available on Amazon, but it really talks about, you know, comparing cannabis 
to the prohibition on alcohol back in the day. It really goes through a lot of history. Why is cannabis illegal in the first place? It gets into the big differences between Canada and the United States and what people really need to understand. And then it gets into companies that people might want to invest in. Hmm. Sounds like I could benefit from reading this book myself, which I am now going to do. Um, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Dan, let's talk about your, uh, your portfolio, uh, your ETF rather. How has it performed in the last, uh, since its founding? Well, our fund um, YOLO, the first one, uh, opened in April of 19. And admittedly, almost everybody in cannabis lost money in 2019. And then we came around to 2020 and things started to rebound. But this is really important to point out. I started to say cannabis is going to separate the good companies from the bad, the profitable and strong balance sheet companies from those, those that don't. And more often than not, the U.S. was going to separate from Canada. So for 2020 calendar year, our fund YOLO was up about 47%. Um, the biggest cannabis index fund, there's only one fund at that time that was bigger than ours. It was negative in 2020. It was negative in 2020. Our fund YOLO outperformed it by 50 something percent. And that's for a couple of reasons. Again, companies separated, those with profitability and strong balance sheets. And more often than not, the U.S. side of the border profited or did well. The stocks did. Um, some of the others did not. Now, we also are actively managed. So there's a lot to say for picking the right stocks. Um, we're not overly active. We're not trading constantly and not high turnover, but we're picking the right stocks, we believe. And in a fast paced, rapidly changing area like cannabis, where there's a lot of disconnect between education about the U.S. versus Canada side of the border, active management is very important. And, um, you know, there's a big difference there. We launched our MSOS fund in September and it's up over 60% since it launched. Uh, it's up nicely, but cannabis stocks is a, it's a tale of two cities, if you will. Um, a big run up after the U S elections, November, December, January. And then they had this runoff in Georgia where the Democrats got control of the Senate and people bought cannabis stocks in the U S and Canada, like, Hey, it's going to be legalized in the U S next week. <laughs> let's, let's everybody buy in. It's going to be the wild west of cannabis. And then that's not the case. You know, right. politicians still got to be politicians. It's messy. It takes some time. Cannabis stocks have pulled back, um, in recent months and, uh, brings us to where we are now at the mid May. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, uh, that's funny you say that. When the rebound started happening in the cannabis space and it uplifted the Canadian stocks as well as the Americans as if there was no difference, to me that was yep. very fascinating because uh, as one of our other guests mentioned, he says the projected EBITDA of the top five Canadian cannabis companies in 2021 is expected to be zero. And he said, contrasting that with the top five U.S. cannabis companies, the multi-state operators, True Leaf, Cure Leaf, etc., there's a much more substantial financial platform in play there. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised. I'm sure you're not surprised. And just, I guess it was just yesterday, the day before, was it that uh, True Leaf announced the acquisition of Harvest Health and Recreation, thereby... Big you know, one. Putting a lot yeah. of long-suffering shareholders out of their misery on the on the harvest side. Um, what uh, what are you? Which are your favorite companies now? I mean, if we looked at your portfolio, that's obviously going to be a reflection. But which are your favorites right now, and why? Sure. So uh, again, we're talking about uh, the U.S. primarily here, and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned the big disconnect with earnings. These U.S. companies have been forced to operate in a frugal manner, in a financially sound manner. You're not gonna see outrageous executive pay. You're not gonna see um, you know, dilution of shareholders happening again and again, like you see in the uh, dumpster fire that's called Aurora mm -hmm. and a number of other Canadian companies. So my favorites, oh, and I'm gonna point out, 
if people look at our website, our ETF has daily transparency. That means the holdings are listed every single day. The next business day, people can't see what I'm doing before I do it. Right. But yeah, look right there at our holdings. Curaleaf is right there at the top. I'm going to point out I'm wearing a little bit of Curaleaf gear right now. <laughs> but um, they're, they are the, um, before this merger goes uh, complete, they are the world's largest cannabis company by sales. Mm -hmm. And I hear news every day. The Canadians will try to disagree with you. Oh, look at Afria and what's now called Tilray after their merger. We're bigger. Well, not by sales, you're not. And certainly not by a lot of other metrics, you're not. You have Cureleaf's the world's biggest. The they right. have... They have yeah, that too. Losing real estate. <laughs> they operate in 23 states. Um, they've, they've done an acquisition to, to grow into Europe. Um, you know, and that's not even counting additional states that are going to come online like adult use in the state of New York. Cureleaf is, is the behemoth. Now, their growth metric has been to, to be in the most states, to have the biggest footprint, because the U.S. opportunity is, you know, at least 10 times the size of the Canadian opportunity. Now, right behind them, uh, Green Thumb Industries, another big favorite of, of ours. They have a big footprint, primarily in the Midwest, um, but they are also a big growth strategy. Um, and a lot of analysts out there have said this is one of their favorite picks for 2021, 2022. Um, I can't mention those without mentioning a couple of others that are called the big four in the United States. Um, TrueLeaf. Now, TrueLeaf is an interesting company. They're liked just as much by all the analysts, but for a long period of time, people said they're practically a single state operator, not a multi-state operator. They dominate in Florida. They have over 50% mar market share in Florida. Florida is one of the best medical markets in the United States. And everybody said it's only a matter of time uh, until they approve adult use in the next couple of years. Well, truly dominates there. In recent years, they've, you know, moved into other states. And then, as you said earlier, they just did this big acquisition of Harvest Health, where I'm confident they'll dominate in Arizona and Pennsylvania as well. That's why they did that acquisition. But, you know, their growth model has been very different than, um, than um, Cura Leafs. They are very profitable. They've been extremely financially sound and frugal in their growth, operating quarter after quarter with profits. Um, and that word profits is rather unheard of on the Canadian side of the border. Um, and the last of the big four is Cresco Labs. Uh, Cresco Labs headquartered in Chicago, a, a very good footprint in the state of Illinois that's been a great adult use recreational market and uh, growing in a number of other uh, areas. So these big four or even five, six or seven MSOs in the United States um, are very financially sound companies that are on the front end of all this growth in the United States. There's a lot to like. So the United States has this uh, persistent condition of non-interstate uh, commerce. And yep. to me, that's, that's the barricade from the real horse race. As soon as the interstate commerce thing goes viable on a national strategy administering both recreational and medical cannabis, that's when I think the U.S. really, you know, the horse that is the United States in the cannabis game really gets up to its full speed. And that's the moment I'm most excited about. When do you see that happening? Soon. <laughs> uh, there's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what's going to happen. People throw around the term, oh, when U.S. legalization happens. Well, in my humble opinion, I don't think U.S. legalization by a certain definition is ever going to happen. And what I mean there, it's never going to be adult use legal coast to coast and available in all jurisdictions. That wasn't even in the Democratic Party platform at the most extreme. What they talked about is decriminalization, you know, taking it off of the DEA Schedule One list, doing safe banking. Now, if you deschedule it and you do safe banking, 
you should be also get another level of reform, which is called um, 280E. Right now, part of the tax code says these companies can't even deduct their business expenses. It's, it's rather outrageous. But if you deschedule it and do the safe banking, you should be able to do the extra caveat of getting rid of 280E. They've talked about medical marijuana coast to coast legal. That would be a big step. And then everybody says leaving it up to the states. Even the most liberal Democrats that are really for cannabis reform are talking about leaving it up to the states for adult use. Now, part of that, as you said, James, might be interstate commerce in states where it's legal. Now, another point where this gets really messy is does that mean a company like Tilray can come into the United States? Nobody knows. <laughs> now, the Canadian CEOs love to talk about the United States because what else are they going to say? They're, are they going to say we're screwed? We don't have a chance? No. All they talk about is getting into the United States. But it's a real big unknown. And a lot of people think even if interstate commerce comes, does that mean a Canadian company can come in the U.S.? They may or may not. They may be able to do it by acquisition or joint venture or something. And they're still going to be way behind the game when it comes to licenses, which are very valuable. There's still going to be state by state regulation, even if we have interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. And it's all coming sometime in the next couple of years, but politicians got to be politicians and it's really messy. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Um, Todd Harrison, who we talked about before the segment, uh, portfolio manager at CB1 Capital, I believe it is. Um, yep. he, he's, uh, he made a good point. I saw him on an interview saying that, you know, it really doesn't matter about interstate commerce or federal prohib prohibition. He says, no matter what, these companies are going to start making money hand over fist off the jurisdictions where it is legal. And, you know, he's, he's largely shown right. Um, that 280 uh, E caveat coming off, does that really sort of uh, take the lid off the jar of profitability for these bigger uh, incumbents at this point, if it happens? Well, well, you had a, had a great point. Uh, and and what, what Todd said is, is very true. Now, if you look strictly at the financials, and we're right in the middle of earnings right now, and Cureleaf came out with earnings, Green Thumb came out with earnings, and they are very strong earnings, and they're raising guidance. These companies are knocking it out of the park right now in the United States uh, under the current limits. And a lot of people say it's like they're operating with one hand tied behind their back. So even if nothing changes reform wise, these companies are operating in a great manner. Plus, we're going to have adult use coming online in New York next year. They're saying the New York market might be bigger than the California market. The California market is currently the biggest market in the world. California alone is bigger than Canada. Um, so it's not based on population. It's, uh, it's based partially on population, and partly on what sales are going to be. So mm -hmm. New York's just one state. So again, these companies are already operating very profitably. Um, their growth metrics are fantastic. With the pullback, you know, they're the multiples are just looking more and more attractive. They can only, you know, lag or, or tread water for so long. I think we're going to see another big breakout like we had in late um, 2020 and early 2001. And when they pass safe banking, when they pass or fix the 280E, when they decriminalize it, a big one is when they allow these companies to uplist to the New York Stock Exchange, that is going to be a huge, a huge positive. But once again, these companies are operating very good right now financially. If nothing changes, it's a night and day difference from some of the financials you see on the Canadian side of the border. Yeah, you bet. So and we're I'm we're bullish to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, on that note, Dan, we're going to leave it there. I could obviously talk to you for hours about this, and I will look forward to coming back to you as soon as it makes sense. 
I want to thank you very much for your time today. Encourage everybody to go out and get a copy of Investing in Cannabis, a book written by Dan Evans, thank you. available on Amazon, as he said. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for your time, Dan. Let's do it again, James. Thank you. You bet. Bye for now. So interesting that Dan is of the MSO crowd operator in the cannabis business, too, and points out that, yes, uh, these Canadian companies might be bigger by sort of money losing real estate in the portfolio, but they're not bigger in terms of sales. And it is indeed going to be the U.S. MSOs that carry the day in the great cannabis battle of our time. And the True Leave acquisition of uh, Harvest Health is clear evidence that the consolidation yeah, yeah. portends a certain maturity in the industry. If I make this general statement, I don't want people to draw unnecessary conclusions, but it would seem to me that the Americans seem to understand business a little more than Canadians. Is that a fair statement? Well, not at all, Ed. Word, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, I kind of mean. I don't know that we want to go down that path. Well, we're already suffering the slings and arrows of Google's indifference to our diatribe because we're not Americans. So, right. I mean, you could point to the American business sense and say that it's largely derived from. But they pay less taxes. You know, you well, know what they, I mean? it's because they flooded the world with useless U.S. dollars, I and know. basically, oh, it's been I guess domination. I was just through. trying to say that they have more experience in business. The, 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 Monkey business. Who's more experienced than Americans in, in business? The English. And for more so than them, the Dutch. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. You know what I'm trying They didn't get to where they were, By but they, have, they had the square. population, right? By playing well, square. Yeah, that's why they got the military, you mean. <laughs> yeah, you, good you're going to take these dollars I don't and know. you're going to value well, them at what we say you're going to well, value they, they're them. They're trying to make cash. Like, there's these companies generating cash flow. The top five cannabis companies in Canada. Well, they can't have, generate any cash flow. Well, That's they all have cash flow. That's they have no profitability. Look, it's got to be a business at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's got to generate like Every your day. like this this agricultural empire you have here is going to have many streams of revenue. I empire. understand. I, mean, I hardly think it's an empire. It's, it's more you know like what? a project in it's progress. It's an empire in your mind, and that will become <laughs> reality. That will become reality. Well, let's hope so. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at some of our charts here today. Okay. We're going to start at it with the U.S. 10-year rate here. It's, yeah. Uh, chugging hard here, treading water in the in the range of a dollar fifty to a dollar seventy today yeah. at a yeah. dollar sixty or one point six three, not a dollar. It's one point six three percent. What is the uh, what is the implication of the persistently high rate of the U.S. 10-year to the immediate economic outlook in your you, opinion? You, you know what? It's telling you. There is a sea change afoot. The chickens a are foot? coming home to roost. <laughs> Chicken feet. This, how, this is how it starts, okay? Like, we don't know where it's going, but if, if you said, well, if nothing happened, you'd say, well, it hasn't started yet. Can't say that anymore. It's started. Well, but this it's is started. the thing. The, you, the Fed has been saying we're targeting 2% inflation for years, and that using that justification to print money ad infinitum, and we've been saying that okay, you are okay, front-loading okay. the inflation into the system, okay, but, but they, it's just not showing up they, yet because it's too flooded with capital and there's too many assets out there. So, so the response by the Fed is that this is transitory inflation. Well, this why is, do they think that you? Why do you think the Fed hires a bunch of baboons? Jim Cummings, the <laughs> chairman of the was it the Boston Fed or the New York Fed? I can't remember. Anyways. He came out and publicly said, and I think we covered this in the show last week, that the, uh, the monetary quantitative easing that's been undertaken over the last several years, this had no impact on markets. Well, you know what? You can say whatever you want. Well, he and, can and, say whatever he wants. Yeah, yeah. look, look I, I can't, I, I would say this. Something's changed here, right? I don't know what, what's going to happen going forward, but it looks like, this rate thing. I mean, it's hanging in, right? Okay, so let's look at the price of lumber. Now, lumber has had an okay. all-time record high earlier uh, this, this week, week. This week, at the yeah. end, of, uh, end of last week. It touched looks like. a high above $1,700 yeah. and has now dropped to $1,390. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Looking at this chart here. Now, if we look at the chart for copper, copper also peaked out here, touched a high of 488 Yeah, yeah. And that, now was, has, that was a Sunday, Sunday evening, Monday morning early. Right, and so now it's it, yeah. got this little corrective mode going yeah, yeah. here. So now, if we're looking at these commodities... But can I make a comment here? Well, can I stop you? <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> Probably not. That trend, the trend of the copper chart yeah. is still intact. Whereas the lumber chart, I would argue, there's a bit, a bit of a breach. Okay. And lumber is okay. easier well, that's to replace. Question, that was the question I was getting to. Was, well, in your you don't opinion, have to. You see, you just sit there. <laughs> I, just, I just babble and you read my mind. And you, <laughs> let's do the meld. The meld. See, <laughs> the only reason we talk is for their benefit. Yeah, not yeah, for we, we, we know where each other is going with duh. us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm just saying that that trend looks a little more intact. I agree with and, you. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so that so let me ask you this: Is this are we going to see a bit of a correction across the the commodities complex now that it has gotten so far ahead of Steema, or is this just a minor well, sort right of market now, correction you'd have that's going to? You, you know, I would say there's a high. good chance it's got to digest that monumental move, and lumber is doing it. Yes. To more to a degree, but you know it's interesting. Have you noticed that gold starting to rumble? Well, let's take a look at the gold chart. Here. Let's get ready. So gold to trading rumble. right now at eighteen forty-eight. Yeah, yeah, but put, you know, put but a, how, been, what, how long is that chart? Range bound. It's uh, two twenty-seven. We're gonna go way back. We're going way back. Well, okay. No, but it's coming. It's I'd I'd argue depending on what time frame you're looking at. If you could look at a year yeah. or two. Well, there we go. There's. 2020 to now. okay 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 that, so that's the peak okay I know where we are now okay. yeah well you know where we are I now. think that that trend line that trend line that is now looking like that is getting ready to breach right and and then you know like these trends seem to go on and on for a while so if that were to breach mm -hmm. to the upside yeah then then we could have a real run in gold so I'm saying you know we got lumber coming off but when things get really ugly gold starts to percolate. That's what I'm saying. Well, so the, what is the normal relationship between the commodities price of copper and the commodity price of gold? Usually gold leads copper. No, I'd, I'd say copper leads gold. Copper is an economic uh, 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 entity. I thought we were supposed to be in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Give okay. me some more of that truth serum. <laughs> That's right. Cheers there, big ears. Oh, truth serum. Okay, so, so the commodities that have just exploded in price have obviously driven, have now percolated down into consumer prices. We're seeing See, that. 40% of the CPI you, is home you, you, prices, Everything right? is... And there we go. The price of lumber went through the roof. Home prices went up. The artificial inventory removal of the yeah. moratorium on foreclosures as has caused 4 million homes in the U.S. to be in a state of foreclosure but not being foreclosed on and therefore out of the normal inventory... That has had the effect of sustaining the higher price moves in houses and real estate, as well as the commodity price going higher. But now all that's starting to sort of weaken. And if interest rates continue to rise, as evidenced by gold that that seems to be the trend, yeah. then we're going to see a major correction in housing. <laughs> and that's going to look, trigger all kinds of revaluations look, to the downside across commodities, uh, stocks. You know what? You know what? It, it, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I just don't know how far rates have to go yet before that scenario. It, it has to happen, I think, because of the the huge amount of paper uh, printed money hmm. debt that is now. So, so at w w what level, James? The question is, what level is when when the the you know the straw breaks the camel's back? You know what? That's what I was going to ask you. Where is the grand inflection point of this century? Well, it started. It started, and now we just have to pay attention. And all and we the can chickens do are coming home. You know, it would be great if we could have some chickens. <laughs> We've got chickens. No, but I mean, we could sort of introduce them into the show as a, sort of a like metaphor, you know, like a... We kind of already did that. They're really? at the beginning of the show. Really? <laughs> Yeah, I got you holding on to a baby chick. You don't remember? Here, well, give me that red remember. cup. You're drinking too much. The okay, okay. Well, look at. <laughs> I say, I say to you that the process is now. You can only print so much money. And I want to make another comment about cryptocurrency. Yeah. I'm starting to think. You know, they. Some of these people have made so much money. They can create inflation. If you were competing with a guy, who was a crypto billionaire, and he wanted to buy a piece of land that you wanted. Yes. He's going to win. Well, it, only it, it, if he can transform that crypto into cash, and that is still well, the. Uh, I, all I'm saying, he could, yeah, he could turn. Can they turn it into cash real easily? Well, I, I don't know. I don't buy and sell crypto, but 
Look at the chart of crypto. I mean, this is the thing. How can you transact in something so volatile? I mean, this is a big yeah. number. So if you're going to do large ticket, like six figure transactions yeah. in yeah. crypto, what day do you actually, what, what moment do you close the transaction? And Look, the so thing that's why I don't think there's too much transacting going on outside of crypto because all you can do with crypto is yeah, buy other yeah. crypto. And and the way it's going, if if all you got to do is start creating cryptocurrency, we're all going to be billionaires. Well, and if we're all billionaires, then it doesn't matter. It becomes meaningless. Well, if 8 billion people have a billion dollars on this planet. Already. Then what happens to the price of commodities? Uh, they go to a trillion. They go to they go a through the roof, and your billion dollars in apparent yeah. money, monetary, yeah, yeah. nominal wealth, is actually got the purchasing so, power of a penny. That's what happens. So this is completely and then you know what happens. False. Then you know what happens. The chickens come home to roost. Well, this is the thing: the chickens are coming home to roost. Know, when you have a virtual asset like Bitcoin outperforming an actual asset yeah. like gold, there's something wrong with the value system yeah. of humanity. Or is it the value system? Are we too old to understand this? And when we all die off, they won't even th they'll think gold is worthless. Well, when the chickens are firmly roosted in their home, we shall see. Okay. Because I okay. think that you won't be able to buy a farm where you can produce your own food and be self-sustaining for 21 million Bitcoin if they printed every one of them, because it's going to zero. You mark my words, it's going to zero. Anyways, that's, uh, okay. that's what I... Okay, well, we've covered a lot of territory. Yes, we have. So now let's talk, let's talk about magic mushrooms, shall we? And we're going to let our next guest carry All that right. conversation. Doug Drysdale is the right. CEO of Cybin Inc., trading on the OTC under symbol CLXPF. Hey there, Midas Letter subscribers. My guest today is Doug Drysdale. He's the CEO of Cybin Inc., Doug, welcome. Thanks for having me, James. Much appreciated. You bet. Doug, uh, let's start with an overview. What is it that Cybin does? So we are taking classical psychedelic molecules, uh, many molecules that uh, other folks would have heard out about, like uh, MDMA and psilocybin and DMT, and we're turning those classical molecules into useful therapeutics for mental health disorders, such as depression and addiction. Mm -hmm. um, this is a remarkable sort of new sort of emerging category to me because obviously based on the success of the cannabis industry, now there seems to be a whole new openness on the part of regulators to look at things that were formerly Schedule I drugs mm -hmm. and consider them in the context of medication. What has happened to drive this change on the, on the regula regulatory side? Look, I think it's an acceptance that uh, what we've been doing to date just isn't working. Uh, during this pandemic, we've seen a, a significant increase in depression and addiction and substance abuse. Uh, and we, when we look back at traditional treatments for these conditions like SSRIs, long term studies have shown that for moderate depression, they're no better than placebo. So we've been treating for decades the signs and symptoms of these disorders without any real breakthrough. And yet, on the, on the other hand, we've known about these psychedelic molecules for almost 80 years. LSD was discovered 78 years ago. And we have decades of data that shows that they're safe and efficacious in a very different way than we usually treat these, these conditions. So we used to go into a physician, taking a pill from the pharmacy, taking that every day. These work, drugs work very differently. In studies out of Johns Hopkins and NYU, Patients that are depressed or have certain addictions have been shown to be completely free from their symptoms or their addictions uh, for months at a time from just one or two doses. So clearly an opportunity to really dramatically change how we treat these disorders and to change people's life. Yeah, remarkable. Um, so then tell me, how do you turn this into a business? How do you monetize this? Well, we've been very fortunate to have the support of uh, many US blue chip biotech investors. Uh, we raised almost $90 million to date. Uh, we have 50 molecules in our library. Uh, this, is, this is fully drug development under, you know, under a complete pharmaceutical regulation. And four major programs that are underway. Uh, we have a, a program entering phase two uh, clinical studies uh, for major depression. Uh, we have a, a late preclinical program for alcohol use disorder. 
uh, using uh, some novel deuterated tryptamines, I can talk about those, and then some ladder programs that will be coming through into the clinic later this year and into in, early next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so specifically, give us, can you give us some examples of the drugs and the treatments that they are being used for? Sure. So our lead program, uh, which we're calling CYB001, very creative, uh, is a sublingual film formulation of psilocybin. So this is a synthetic uh, molecule, but the original, originally psilocybin came from magic mushrooms. So we've been able to take that naturally occurring product, synthesize it in a lab, and combine it with technology that delivers uh, a bit like a Listerine breath strip under the tongue and dissolves very quickly. Uh, so our hope is that we can get a very fast onset uh, a short duration of action, maybe it, still a few hours, uh, and then reduce side effects. And as I mentioned before, what we've seen out of studies from Johns Hopkins uh, using psilocybin in major depression is a 71% response rate. And that's about four times the effect sizes are seen with current treatments today, with many patients being free of their depression for five or six months at a time. Wow. You know, it's funny, I, I did a lot of uh, experimenting with psilocybin in my younger days uh, on a self-administered non-clinical basis. And I can say with certain uh, empirical knowledge that um, I can say I've experienced firsthand the antidepressive effects of psilocybin. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious as to what needs to happen to make it more of a functional uh, therapeutic substance. Uh, I mean, I guess making it synthetic is one thing, but but I guess there's a an intensity that has to be brought down to something that's more useful. Is is that correct? Well, it's true that there's lots of anecdotal benefits uh, from people who have taken these substances personally, and that that's great. Uh, what we're trying to do here is develop a, a more controlled environment and a more co controlled dosing. What's really important, it seems, uh, with uh, with these treatments is the associated psychotherapy that goes alongside the drug. So it's a combination of both, both the molecule and the therapy. There's a recent study uh, looking at MDMA in PTSD, and about a third of patients were uh, remission in remission from their PTSD uh, with just psychotherapy, but two thirds with psychotherapy and MDMA together. So there appears to be a synergistic effect between the two when 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 given appropriately, and a doubling the effect size in that particular study. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so tell me, how long until, I mean, has I been a profitable entity at this point? Let's start there. No, we don't have revenues today. We are in drug development, so we're a drug development company, uh, and we expect to see our first treatment on the market around 2024, 2025. So we're a few years away from market. Drug development, you know, is a is a fairly long process. Uh, but what's great about these molecules, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that we know an awful lot about them. So we're not starting from scratch. This isn't a binary biotech play. Uh, we're taking well-known, well-characterized molecules where we know the safety, we know the efficacy, and we're simply tweaking them using chemistry and drug delivery to turn them into useful therapeutics just a few years away from now, which in drug development terms is, is, is quite short. Sure. So you've, does Cybin envision setting up uh, physical locations, clinics, to treat patients directly, or are you more looking at providing the drugs as a product to clinicians? Uh, that's a good question. And at the very heart of our uh, drug discovery is as a goal of making these treatments as scalable as possible. Some of the treatments that are in development today are four or six hours in duration. And we're using some novel chemistry to shorten that duration down to maybe one to two hours. And our view is that uh, one to two hour treatment could be very easily supported by current infrastructure today, current clinics. There are depression clinics, there are IV infusion centers, uh, there are clinics that uh, perform all kinds of uh, services for, for patients in a one hour session versus a six hour session. So our goal isn't to go and spend our, our investors money on, on bricks and mortar, uh, on, on, on real estate, but to partner with chains of clinics that already exist that could then uh, deliver the, the psychotherapy services around our molecules. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Doug, where exactly in the world are you planning to sort of develop? Is this all just a, a US-based operation or are you going to be sort of global in footprint? Yes, we're expanding quickly. So we have a science team in the Boston area uh, that is uh, that we have a lab there. 
Uh, we're doing some uh, preclinical work and uh, some development work in Canada. Uh, we're doing some chemical synthesis and preclinical work in the UK. So already this is happening on a multinational level and we have to work that way in order to align uh, our, our development work with regulators in both Europe and, and the US. You bet. All right, Doug, that's a great introduction to the company. We're going to leave it there for now. I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thanks for your time today. That's great. Thanks for having me, James. Much appreciated. It's amazing how many can uh, psychedelics companies there are materializing in this new trend where psychedelics are becoming legalized. I mean, yes. it sounds like it's, it's another wonder drug. When is the last time you ate some psychedelics? You know what? I, I've, I've had mushrooms on several occasions, but not really recently. Maybe last week? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, so you okay. normally eat them every day, uh, do you? I, I think a couple years ago. Right. That's, that's, I had some mushrooms with some of your friends. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. We all ate them together, didn't we? Did we laugh like maniacs or what? I don't remember. Do you, do you think that the uh, consumption of uh, psychedelics at, in a recreational setting is conducive to a longer-term mental health and well-being? I don't think so. You don't? I, you don't. Oh. Would you, would, would you always be taking them? Or would you at some point you say, well, well I'm better now. I'll stop <laughs> taking them. <laughs> well, I mean, there's uh, everything in moderation, including moderation. So every once in a while, right. like, I find that like, consuming take a, take large break, volumes... So maybe no, don't do them every day, but do them well, six days a week or so. If you want to have a truly transformational experience, then you eat two or three grams of magic mushrooms. Right. And you have a conversation with the universe like you'll never have again. So you don't want to do that every day because then you're just off in the stars and nobody yeah. can talk to you. you got yeah. no reality. Yeah. However, I, I credit my personal sense of well-being with the regular consumption of, of psychedelics yes. throughout my youth. Okay. And we used to eat like LSD and like magic for, mushrooms. For breakfast. And well, did we have <laughs> eaten them for breakfast. We once split, there were four of us, we once split 80 hits of acid and went driving around in Toronto. And, really? But ate them, consumed them over the course of like driving, 24 hours. Driving around. We actually, we, we, we took my mom's Cadillac. I was a teenager and it was a huge disaster, but it, it was a lot of fun. It was transformational. And uh, you, yeah. you didn't crash, did you? No, we didn't. We did, we took out a stop sign. That's all we did. We took out a stop sign okay. in a four wheel drift accidentally. And that is it. Four wheel drift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in a Cadillac. Yeah, yeah, Cadillac yeah. Coupe de Ville. A lot of maneuverability there, right? Well, it's got more momentum and inertia than I think <laughs> maneuverability. <laughs> Whoa! You didn't flip it. <laughs> no, we didn't flip it. No, no. Everybody, okay. Okay. everybody survived. Um, so we're going to take a couple of uh, questions from our... So it obviously our... hasn't affected your mental uh, stability or anything like that. Sorry, what? <laughs> what mental stability? I didn't say anything about stability. I said when a well-being. Yeah, where's, uh, where's the hatchet? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're going to take a couple of questions, audience questions here that have been sent in to us. And where are they here? I had them right. Okay. Here we go. Here's a question from JD on YouTube. He wants our thoughts on the uranium sector. What do you think of uranium, Ed? Well, my uranium, you, my, my uranium's fine. How is your uranium? <laughs> cranium. Your cranium is uranium. That's called like uranium having got your head is, up your ass. Is, you know, they, they, when they talk about energy <laughs> uh, equals, like the energy from a barrel of oil and the energy for a little piece of uranium. And I don't know the exact ratio, but I saw this. Uh, Presentation as measured once. in what calories? Well, just Kilojoules? like you, you know, you don't need a lot of uranium to power a city. You know, it's it's the danger. It's the it, right. You know, the, the there has never been a uranium plant constructed in the history of humanity where the government was not the last responsible entity for any disaster. Yeah. And as we saw in Chernobyl and more recently in Japan, the government can't do anything when a disaster hits. Right. So that makes, to me, that makes uranium non-viable. It's the kind of technology you that we that rolled France out too is, soon. You know that France almost gets their entire energy from uranium. Did you know that? From my uranium or your uranium? <laughs> well, that's, yes, minute, that's true. That's because they got no oil and gas. The French, they use well, all their oil for cooking those well, fries, you know? I think once the technology gets developed. Well, there are and, some and, new technologies. And, but, but you know what? So what do you every, think about every, the uranium price? Yeah, I think I think it's all. If I I don't know, 
it's it's not that easily followed. You have to sort of go to a website, I think. Uh, it's not like you can't copper. just go to Trading View and punch in uranium. No, but but look, look. There's been some futures. disasters, but there, there, there we go. Have... Uranium futures right here. Look at that. Let's pull up that chart. Really? Oh, let's go to the full here we future go. Let's chart. Go. Okay, so uranium has. Uh, whoa, that's there's yeah, a real heavily yeah, traded yeah, stock. Yeah, well, eh? it's all you know. What it's... does it trade three times a day? No, oh, it trades by contract and by direct contract, yeah, not yeah, as yeah. a commodity. It's, it's a different. Okay, different so beast. current current price is thirty dollars and seventy five cents a pound. That's up from $24 back in March 06th. So we had this peak back here in, wow. uh, in yeah. May, yeah. So it's, $34 a pound. What's the low there? Uh, excuse me, right? No, keep going, keep going, keep down going. Down here? Yeah. Well, so in March this year, it got down to 27.20. Now it's starting to move higher. It's going yeah. from 27.20 yeah. up to 30. It looks like it's, it's going to start going higher, I think. It looks, to, you know, no. quickly. I don't think that uranium is a good long-term bet because I think we're going to see advances in fusion sure that are going to make uranium sure. obsolete okay. because okay. it's essentially safe for technology yeah yeah well that, that you know there you go but but it is you know a little bit of uranium is is like a lot of oil okay here's yeah. another question from one of our faithful and loyal audience members why have us mso's been in and it been in a downtrend for most of 2021 us mso's yeah. is that like a a flying object? No. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-state operators. Now, you did mention just before oh, we started this clip that you'd stopped following cannabis so closely, and there's no purer evidence of that than forgetting what well, an MSO I, I, stands I, I, for. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy smoking it. <laughs> that might have something to do with the fact that you forgot what MSO actually stood for. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so the reason sure. MSOs have been in a downtrend, as Doug Drysdale, or not Doug Drysdale, but Dan Aarons pointed out in an earlier interview, is, uh, is largely because the expected momentum to materialize towards broad decriminalization and legalization nationally in the United States has not yet materialized at the hands of the Biden administration. And so all of that, that impetus that was the early uh, sort of yeah, so what's happening move to the upside in, with, uh, with your buddy Biden. What's happening? My buddy? Yeah. How you, is he my buddy? You like him. Why, why do I like him? I mean, he's better than the alternative. What is it? I is think he? so. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, at least he's not starting any insurrections on Capitol Hill. Well, that's because... <laughs> at least he's not sticking his, poking his finger in the eye of the Chinese. He's have a nap. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Oh, we're going down. He's low energy Joe Biden, is he? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, oh, no, you better you watch hear? it. We'll be kicked off okay. of Twitter, too. Okay, so I, here's the look, last just, question I'm we're going to take. Kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm apolitical. I apolitical. I am. Apolitical. The last question from the audience for this week. What sector do you see the most upside potential from? Crypto, psychedelics, esports, or what, what other sector? I, I would have to say that if, if the interest rate thing continues, and maybe, you know, we stay stagnant for a while and then we start to slowly go up if it starts to happen you know i i think com commodities and and ultimately gold like i gold as the leading monetary commodity well, i but, agree 100 percent and any commodity product so like copper tubing that plumbers yeah, use, yeah, yeah, the yeah. price of that's going to go through the roof right. once that high commodities yeah, price yeah. filters down into the supply chain and the retail. I, I just want to make another point that, uh -oh. that uh, I think is relevant to you think so. everybody's concerned about okay. money and finances. Yeah. And in, 19, in 2007 or 8, the price of oil peaked at around $145. Yes. I think the most I saw a liter of gasoline was like $1.45, $1.48. You know, I think Vancouver saw a buck fifty-five, buck sixty. The point I'm getting at is, it's now a dollar thirty in Toronto, and oil is half the price. Like it's, it doesn't take long, and I don't know is that more taxes, but the consumer is getting pinched, a little bit. A Some might say ass raped. <laughs> We're back on uranium again. There we go. No, <laughs> my uranium or your uranium? Hey, what yeah. what what uranium this time? Mine or your? <laughs> Look at yeah. anyway, yeah. anyway. So, Anyways, so the, the winds of like the the what uh, the seeds of change, m malcontent have been sown, and the chickens have come home to roost. 
Yeah, it's starting, isn't it? <laughs> I agree. You know, people, you go I down agree. and get your lumber. I can't yeah. afford this fucking lumber. All sorry. right. No. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, so my, our next guest is involved in uh, the esports uh, media category, and he is a former professional football player. Conrad Valesha joins us now. ESE Entertainment trades on the OTC under the symbol ENTEF on the TSX Venture under the symbol ESE. We don't own it. We're not conflicted, so we have no opinion. <laughs> Hey there, Midas Letter subscribers. My guest now is Conrad Valesha. He's the CEO of ESE Entertainment, Inc., trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol ESE and trading in the United States under the symbol ENTEF. Conrad, welcome. Thanks for having me on. We're excited to jump into it. Yeah, you bet. All right, Conrad, quick overview. What is the business of ESE Entertainment? So as you guys all know, esports and gaming is an absolutely exciting, uh, monumental business opportunity at the moment. You know, it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity and ESC uh, really prides themselves as being the infrastructure ecosystem for esports and gaming. So, you know, our goal from day one has to become the largest infrastructure esports company in the world. So when I say infrastructure, we provide technology, media rights, tournament organization, a professional team, our sim grid, sim racing side of the business. So basically encompassing the entire ecosystem, a 360 approach to providing support and infrastructure to the whole gaming and esports ecosystem. Sure. Um, esports is something we're hearing more and more about every day. What is the about the size of the global total addressable market for esports? You know, there's a lot of different figures uh, floating around, but typically um, you hear a lot of the billion plus uh, opportunity for just esports alone. Obviously, gaming is even larger, so it's a multi billion dollar industry. But I think uh, esports is just going to climb up and catch up to that overall gaming uh, opportunity in the multi billions coming up in the future here. Sure. And so of all of the segments that you talk about there in the infrastructure side, is there one that's more of interest to ESE than others? Or are you taking a, a holistic approach to the entire industry? We're definitely taking a holistic approach, but just like any business, you always see kind of these different parts of business that are creeping up on others, uh, whether it's a bigger profit margin, for example, or opportunity size. Uh, what we've seen within our organization is the sim racing side of the business has tremendous margins, you know, 30, 40 plus percent on margins. And then from like a big blue sky opportunity, we're really seeing the media right side uh, being this, you know, really massive opportunity. Um, you know, you look at, you know, getting like an NFL rights, let's use an example, or, you know, exclusive rights for a certain country or region. It's just such a larger, big blue sky opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. So then uh, esports is being, uh, is seeing rather an explosion in popularity in large part because of the global pandemic, I'm assuming. Has that been a growth factor? Yeah, I mean, you know, it just absolutely supercharged the industry. You know, we just saw the intake of inquiries, uh, the opportunities that pertains to sponsorship, advertising. It just absolutely supercharged our industry. Um, and I don't think it's going away. What it did is just shine a big, bright light on what ESC is doing and just in general, the, the industry. So the actual esports side, um, you know, getting non <clears throat> getting non gamers involved uh, in the gaming and just bring a whole different set of eyes uh, to the industry has been fantastic. Right. Uh, okay. So how does, uh, how does ESE make money? Where does your biggest revenue flow from? So as it pertains to revenue, that, that's something that we really pride ourselves uh, at ESC for is, you know, one of the few groups in esports that's actually generating meaningful revenues. Uh, and we actually have a very uh, balanced revenue. So when I said, you know, we have the technology side of the business, the media rights side of the business, uh, you know, and our teams, you know, we're generating revenues on all those fronts um, and it's very balanced. So, you know, 
you know, you could break it up like a pie in thirds, you know, we're really generating equal revenue from all those different elements. And we're really seeing an uptick as it pertains to revenue on the sim racing side. So I think this year and moving forward, that's going to be a big revenue driver for us as well. So it's a really nice balance. Um, and as I said, those big blue sky opportunities in sim racing and on the media rights, I think will slowly start to creep up a little bit more compared to the rest. You bet. Uh, so what's a competitive landscape like in terms of uh, the whole industry? Is it a very crowded space? Or are you sort of off on it in a world of your own or what's what's the outlook there? I think that's the exciting part. You see, you know, there's a lot of fantastic companies over there. EGLX, you know, surpassed a billion dollar market cap. They're generating meaningful revenues. Uh, where I see we're kind of on an island a little bit is we're one of the few groups that actually generates revenue. So that's the exciting part. So you see groups like EGLX getting rewarded for generating revenue. We feel like we're the next in line. Um, you know, and when you compare to other groups in the industry, uh, we have meaningful revenue and it's growing fast and we have a aggressive acquisition pipeline that just can continue to stack on more revenue. Um, so I think that's kind of a competitive, you know, advantage versus the other groups out there. Sure. How do you uh, how do you get to profitability? Are you guys profitable yet? You know, we're really lean. Our company's really lean. We have no debt. Uh, I think we could get to profitability by the end of the year this year, uh, and definitely in 2022. Well, we'll see profitability. It just depends on how much we're going to reinvest into the business. If we scaled back the business a little bit, uh, I think we could hit that mark by the end of the year. But we really want to focus on growing, 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 and acquiring these new uh, accretive groups. Sure. So you acquired 51% 50, interest in World Performance Group last month. Is acquisition your primary growth strategy, or is it a balance of acquisition and organic growth? Once again, that's an exciting part. You know, we have a robust uh, acquisition pipeline, you know, over a hundred million in revenue in that pipeline, and we're going to be very aggressive with those acquisitions. However, it's nice to see that the actual core group is growing very fast as well. If you saw our last news release, we just signed a seven figure contract uh, to roll out a production of an esports show uh, coming up this year. So both sides are just firing on all cyl cylinders and we're generating you know, big contracts. And we also have that huge growth from the acquisition side. Sure. Uh, does you do you generate your audience at the expense of the physical sort of sporting audience globally, or is this a new audience that's complementary to the global physical audience? I think it's absolutely complementary, you know, and I think it's really heading in that direction. Uh, you know, I didn't mention it, but I'm a former professional athlete, and the crossover into traditional sports, into music, into entertainment in general. Um, you just see it more and more. And I mentioned the sim racing side of the business. You know, all these traditional sports are crossing over and vice versa. Uh, so I think it's just, it's like a mushroom effect. You know, we're really crossing over and there's just a completely new audience in general, right? That whole Gen Z audience wants a different product, a different product for them. Sure. So tell tell me a bit more about your background. You say you're a professional athlete. Yeah, so I played in the CFL, um, did that for about five years. And, you know, it gave me a really great insight uh, into entertainment and business. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, pro sports uh, is entertainment and it's business. And I really got to see large scale, you know, ever from media rights to how teams are operated to how advertising works, sponsorship. I was always really keen to learn of how all those little intricate elements worked in a you know professional sports setting. And the crossover to esports um, is identical in my opinion. You know, everybody tries to really overcomplicate esports and gaming, but the similarities with what's already out there, I mean, it's just, identical right it's just a little bit of a different flavor um, and we got to really capitalize on this is the next generation of sports you bet 
All right, Conrad, that's a great introduction to the company. We're going to leave it there for now. We will come back to you soon in the future and see how you're making out. Thank you very much for your time today. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. So eSports, you know, there's another sector that really hasn't matured yet. I mean, we've got some big winners. Our, our pick, uh, the score, has now returned almost 1,000% since our pick back in 2018. 1,000%? 1,000%. That's how good we are at picking stocks, Ed. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk about a few companies that we might feel have great potential now, and we're talking about them because we own them, right? Well, we own, we own them, but we're not just talking. They owe them. us. <laughs> Either we own them or they owe us, but if they don't owe us and we don't own them, yeah, no, no. What is, what's our tagline now? We don't care. We don't care. We don't care. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's good. So let's start with Danovation. Now this is uh, this is one that you've been uh, touting yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of they, times. Yeah, they on the show. they they have they're a, they're a Internet of Things company. Okay. Uh, John Ricci's done a great job. Yeah, we had CEO, him on just yeah, a couple yeah, weeks yeah. ago. And uh, it's it's starting to sh develop a pattern here that's worth paying attention to. In fact, today's candle is exceptionally positive. Being in a, you know, it took out the low this and it closed the high. Here. Yeah, that last green candle. Yeah, okay. And, but, the, but the point is they have uh, very large customers. They're doing business in, with LCBO. This is all on their internet. Yeah. I think you got to watch this because this is a real business. They're generating real cash flow. Okay. And my pick for the week is, uh, again, going to be GMG, Graphene Manufacturing Corp., they put out a press release this week announcing that the, uh, the graphene aluminum ion battery that they are developing in partnership with the University of Queensland in Australia has demonstrated reliable higher power density than any other battery on the market in the rechargeable segment. So this, this company so, has... So, a, so, so th was this enable someone to charge whatever they're charging faster? Is that what this is all about? Not necessarily faster, but... Faster could be part of it. The speed of charging is increasing as technology advances across all rechargeable technologies. But what it means is that instead of having to charge this, plug it in at the end of every day, maybe now you only have to plug it in at the, once a week because the battery, the power density is higher. So it holds more power. Holds more power. Holds more power. And ultimately, will they are trying to achieve higher voltages. Right now, I think it said 1.7 volts was their reliable uh, voltage, but uh, that's that's why GMG is one of my top picks. It's a company that takes well, natural you know, we gas. Well, we should put the chart up. The charts, the chart. We're looking at the chart. Or not? Or not? Oh, well, that's weird. There's the chart. There it is. Now look at that chart. That's now I got to disclose that I own a boatload of shares that I boatload. paid. Boatload. Boatload. Forty cents a share I paid. So obviously, I'm sitting at a 4x profit right now. I'm hugely conflicted. Jesus. Tremendously and, and conflicted. And you also have this, I don't give a shit attitude. Well, that's because I've, <laughs> I've sold some. Now I've got money in my jeans. Now I've got a smile on my face. I've got a red cup full of who knows what. Hooch. Hee. Hoochie. <laughs> Hoochie coochie. Anyways, uh, well, that's uh, an impressive looking pattern, I gotta tell you. Well, that, uh, as my yeah. one broker said, he says that stock can take a punch and get up again. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, it had a couple it's, of down days. You know, again, a technical comment, just, you know. Well, the great thing about Graphene Manufacturing Group is everybody involved with this company is from Royal Dutch Shell's uh, natural gas. LNG plant division. They were the guys who engineered these <coughs> massive plants. And they said, you know what, we could take this low commodity price natural gas and we could turn it into a high commodity price graphene crystal it, of 16 it, variations. This is mind boggling. And build a this battery. Is, this is at truly it. like, oh, if yeah. you said, Ed, how, how, would you, how would you do that? Yeah. Ask me how I, much I, I think say, this share is going to be, these shares are going to be in a year. I can't tell you. <laughs> okay, but but but, but ah, this is this is so what weird. would you say? This is a technological uh, advancement that is like like a, a real uh, you know like a, 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 a something that's like an inflection point. Yeah, like, I, I don't know what to say. Oh yeah, it's a like game how, changer. Game changer, disruptor. 
game changer. <laughs> is that the word you're looking for? I don't know. Term? I was trying to say. Yeah, it's a game changer if how, we get to commercial. How much is it like, are, they, are there a hundred of these things happening every year? Or is this oh. once in a decade? No, there are many different companies working on better batteries than the lithium ion battery. Ba lithium ion batteries, don't forget, were invented in the 80s. Right. So this is an old technology that has been become the incumbent. The reason electric cars are so expensive is because graphene, cobalt, or sorry, not graphene, but lithium, cobalt, copper, and uh, nickel that all comprise lithium ion batteries are all roaring higher with the commodity, general commodity price movement higher. Right. Aluminum and graphene are not moving so high because they're in much higher abundance. So anytime you can make a graphene battery with the higher power density, right. with cheaper components, you're looking at a game changer in the whole well, okay. space. Okay, okay, well, you know what? That's my two born cents. At night, but not last night. And I just want to say before we sign off for the day, Voxter Analytics is our client and I am also a shareholder in that company. That's another one that I have great hopes for. It is going to change transform the speed of real estate transactions from months to hours. And that's why I'm excited about that. Okay. That's our show for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Send in your questions. And anybody you'd like to see us try to get on for a guest, please let us know. We'll do our best. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no thank you. No, thank you. No, thank no, you. No, thank you. No, 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 no. no, no, no.